before anything can happen, the clay must be chosen. And we see such parallels. Back in the day, the potter would go down to a pit in an area of his choosing and dig out the clay that he desired to use. Today, we just get online and order it. <laughs> but we often need to be reminded of what Jesus said in John 15, 16, that you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2, 9, that you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, light as we have been, as we have now obtained his mercy. Well, I find it interesting that at the bottom of the vessel is called the foot. Because in Psalm 40, verse 1, the psalmist said, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry, and he brought me up out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon the rock and established my steps. Well, once the clay is chosen, then the wedging process begins. The potter will purge all the impurities and little fragments of debris that are collected over time. You see, we too often collect debris and impurities as we're in this world. So we need to be wedged. We need to be cleansed. Psalm 119.9 asks, how can a young man cleanse his way? Well, the answer is by taking heed to your word. It takes us back to the context with Jeremiah where the people had gotten away from his word. In fact, in John 15.2, Jesus said, we are already clean because of the word which he has spoken to us. Well, the wedging also removes the air pockets. The air is like pride in our lives as we know that God resists the proud. You see, there are two things that will cause the clay to burst as soon as it goes through the fiery process. And that is number one, air pockets. And number two, not quite sitting on the shelf long enough. That's what happened to this piece. Just like it says in Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Peter instructs us in 1 Peter 5, 6 to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt us in his due time, for he cares for you. You see, once we change our mind and we finally decide to give it over to Jesus, he will change our hearts, fulfill, and then fill us with his spirit. And then we'll be conformed into his image for his purpose to reflect his glory. The problem is we can't always tell if there's air in the clay. It's only as the clay is worked over and even pounded that the air is revealed. So as we are, each just a lump of clay, we must do as the psalmist tells us in Psalm 139, 23, ask him, to search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Well, get ready because the moment we give up, change our mind and surrender to the master, that's when the clay gets placed on the wheel and sometimes we get slammed down, don't we? But take heart because the harder we're slammed, the more secure we'll be. One time I was doing pottery and I put my clay on the wheel and I pushed the wheel pedal and that little piece of clay went flying across the room because it wasn't quite slammed down hard enough. Well, the potter then pushes and pulls on us and we know it's to get us centered. And though he can be firm at times, yet he is really so gentle. And I love the centering process, because that is precisely when we are the most protected. You see, it's while the potter's hands are on the vessel that nothing can touch it unless it first filters through his hands. And I love that it's only the potter's hands that can center us. Man can't. Only the spirit of the living God. You see, our master is a personal God. And ultimately, too many believers are walking around unbalanced because we think we know what's best. Hello? Yet it's only God 
through his word and his spirit that we are centered and grounded in his love. Colossians 1.21 tells us we were once alienated and enemies in our mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel. You see, it's only when God's hand is upon us as we focus on Jesus that we will not be moved. Well, from the beginning of the process, pliability is so important. You see, the clay can't be too wet, yet it can't be too dry. Yet it's only the potter that knows exactly what conditions are needed for his purposes to be brought forth. That's why I love Romans 8.28, where it says that we know that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord, those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In Romans 9.28, It goes on to say, But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? Does the potter have power over the clay? Obviously, the answer is yes, he does. Well, once the piece is centered and the potter begins to form the clay, he begins by pushing down in the center. Do you know what I love about this? is that the center is called the heart. And no one can see inside the heart except the potter. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says that man looks on the outward, but God looks upon the heart. And think about it. Before it's opened up, what is it full of? Itself. In fact, back in Jeremiah 17, 9, it says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? But then it's answered in verse 10 where he says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Yet as we come before him, we can pray to the master. In Psalm 139, 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. And the great news is the more the clay is opened up, the more the master can fit inside. Well, when the potter is pulling up the clay, bringing it up, it's always to make some sort of vessel. But while we're in this process, we don't always know what type of vessel we will be made into. Oh, we think we know what we're going to be made into. But the one thing we do know for sure is what 2 Corinthians 4, 7 tells us, that we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God, not of us. Though verse 8 goes on to say, we're hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed, We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. But we are always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. You see, it's not about the beauty of the vessel. We get it so backwards. It's not even how the vessel is being used. You see, we are all serving vessels where and how God chooses to use us. You see, we can have the appearance of becoming one thing, and then boom, we turn into something else. Have you ever noticed that? We think we understand God's plans. The Bible says that a man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And while we can be being made into a tall, beautiful vase that could possibly use some flowers in it, and we think, oh, wow, this is going to be awesome. God's going to use me in a mighty way. And then all of a sudden, bam, we may end up 
being turned into a short, fat bowl. <laughs> Some of us understand that. <laughs> Well, the entire time the potter is working, he is seeing to it that we don't crumble or get ruined. And he's always supplying the water that's needed to keep us pliable, not allowing us to get too dry in his hands. Yet when we encounter hardships, trials, and persecutions, we can feel so dry, can't we? We can be thinking, Lord, come on, I need something here. I'm feeling pretty dry. And maybe you're here tonight and you see no way out of your situation. Or maybe you're here tonight and you see no way you're going to get to have your way in your situation. Well, there's good news because Jesus didn't leave us as orphans, but he gave us his word and he also sent his Holy Spirit as a helper. In scripture, the Holy Spirit is often referred to as water. In fact, when Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well, you guys all know the story. She was a mess. She'd been with so many men looking to fulfill the void in her heart for love, but she came up empty every time. She found herself dry and in need. But the good news is Jesus is in the business of filling us and refilling us and refilling us as there's a need with his love. I know that there are many testimonies in this room tonight that can attest to the fact that Jesus is always ready to pour out just enough upon us if we would just come to him. Just as John 4.13 tells us that Jesus said to the woman at the well, whoever drinks of this water, speaking of the water that's in the physical well, will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give will never thirst The water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. So just as the clay needs to be monitored and refreshed with water often as it's being worked, we too continually need to seek that fresh filling of the Holy Spirit as it is only the Spirit that makes us pliable in the Master's hand. Well, something I noticed as I was working the wheel one time is as the clay needs to be brought up higher and higher, as it becomes becomes a tall vessel, the wheel needs to slow down. The taller the vessel becomes, the slower the wheel needs to go. Or it will again get off balance. You see, we can't go to one scripture or another to build doctrine. Unfortunately, it's so easy for us to get swayed one way or another. What seems right to one way or whatever, it's not always right. The interesting thing is when the piece is being centered, the wheel goes as fast as it can. It goes quickly. And isn't that the way it is with the gospel? It's such a simple message. All you must do to be saved is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and confess that he is, he's the way, the truth, and the life. Confess him with your mouth, believe with your heart. It's simple. But then as we start studying the word, we start being raised up so we think, and it's time to slow down because we can't continue to go that fast. We must slow down and look at the entire counsel of the word of God, balancing his word with the heart of Jesus, allowing scripture to interpret scripture, letting go of what, where, when, and how we think we should be used. Why is it that we think we know what our vessel should look like or what it should be used for or when it should be used? I think it's because we have preconceived ideas of what God should do. But why is that? Well, I'm here to say that it could be, just maybe, that we're filling our lives with the wrong things, with certain books, magazines, things that we read, the television programs that we watch. It may be that we are allowing the subtleties and the compromise of the world to shape our image rather than the master potter to shape our image through his word. I learned the hard way and I am still learning that lesson. I can remember a time in my life, several times in my life, but one in particular where my son was diagnosed with a fatal heart condition. And I can remember arguing with God God, when I brought him home from the hospital, that's not what I meant when I said, bring glory to yourself. 
thought maybe Billy Graham worship leader or something. You know how that goes. We have great plans. We think we know how God can use us. God spoke to my heart, said, it's not your plans that bring glory to me. It's mine. I know what I'm doing. I am the master potter. You are the clay. Be quiet and just be flexible in my hands. Well, we can tell we're resisting God's plan when we're grumbling and complaining because it's not going how we thought. That's what I was doing. We can cry out, why me? Or we can get angry. Or we can turn our backs on God altogether as we demand our own way. But oh man, we need to be careful when that happens because in Isaiah 45, 9, it says, woe to him who strives with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or shall your handiwork say he has no hands? Instead, we as the clay are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. In fact, 2 Timothy 2.21 tells us that if we cleanse ourselves from the latter, speaking of ungodliness and being filled with self and our own righteousness, he will make a vessel for honor sanctified and useful for the master. Don't you want to be useful for the master? I do. He wants to prepare us for every good work. Paul says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable or your acceptable act of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, something that we all need to remember as we go through this process is that nothing but nothing will replace the painful process of being formed and molded and poked and prodded and slammed down as we're being conformed into the image that the potter is making, the image of Jesus Christ. And once we surrender and we become pliable in his hands, that is when we understand his perfect will. I think of Job as the Bible says he was the most righteous man that lived, which shows that it's not always pride that causes us to get slammed down to that will. Amen? That's good news in a way. But sometimes God allows the enemy to mess with us because he desires to slim, simply show his glory through our vessel. As we know that Satan needed permission to have at it with Job. But I love what Job said. As he was slammed down, he lost all of his livestock, his livelihood. All of his children were dead. He lost everything. He even lost the support of his wife as his wife turned to him and said, Honey, you might as well just curse God and die because you're such a mess. Yet after the trial was over and Job remained faithful, he never gave up his faith in God. He was able to attest to the faithfulness of God. The Bible tells us that the Lord restored Job's losses and gave him twice as much as he had before the trial. And that is how it, Job was able to say, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. You see, it takes us from a place of knowing about God to really knowing God and being able to respond by being able to pour him out upon others. Follow me, but don't follow me unless I'm following Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ, as Christ pours through us. Well, once we've surrendered our will for his, once we've been centered, once we've been conformed into his image, we realize that we're not alone. You see, there's many vessels in the house of God, some for honor and some for dishonor. And it's really up to us what we choose to do. If we choose to cleanse ourselves from the latter, we will become a vessel of honor. God isn't, it's not God's desire that any should perish. He came so that the whole world might receive him. That is his plan. It's just a matter of us responding to him. But as we realize that we're not alone, that there's many vessels in the house of God, he will reveal that he's going to get rid of the rough edges eventually. 
And that's because God's will for us is to have unity in the body of Christ. We're told in 1 Peter 2, 4, that, come, that we come to him as a living stone, rejected in, in deed by men, but chosen of God as precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy pre priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You see, in time of antiquities, they didn't always use mortar with those stones. In fact, even today in Africa, they'll take a stone and they chisel off the rough edges painstakingly so that the stones will fit perfectly together so closely that no air or weather will come in between him. And what we would be like if the body of Christ would allow God to take off the rough edges, rather than rejecting each other because of the rough edges, but allowing God to let love cover those rough edges to smooth them out. Now, sometimes the enemy comes in and he wants to come in and divide us. He doesn't want those rough edges to be smoothed off because then he can sneak in between. God wants to smooth it so that we're so smooth that we are perfectly joined together. And sometimes he even uses another believer to do that. We're just to resist and, sub and not resist, but submit to it. I love what Zephaniah 3.9 says, that the day is coming when I will give to the people's purified lips that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and listen, to serve him shoulder to shoulder. Isn't that a beautiful picture? This is God's desire for the body of Christ, that the enemy would not be able to come in between us as we are making the temple of God collectively. In fact, that was Jesus' prayer in John 17. You can re read 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13, how Christ is not divided. We are the body of Christ so that we ought not be as well. Because remember, it's all about the treasure that is in us. It's not about us. Well, once the potter has made you into that basic vessel that he desires, it's not over. Because then we must sit on the shelf for a long while. And just as hard as the process of being made is, we know that it's especially hard when we see others being taken off the shelf and we're still sitting there. And we think, I should be the one being raised up. I'm ready to go into the kiln. I'm ready to be served. But it's not up to us, is it? It's up to the Lord. It's by his spirit. But then we're ready for the kiln. The interesting thing to me in working with pottery is there's different types of clay. I didn't know that. There's what there is called the low fire clay. And that's heated to about 1,800 degrees. And then there's high fire clay. That's heated to about 2,300 degrees. Now the low fire clay, it just quite can't stand up to the high fire. The high fire is more like the stoneware, microwavable, oven proof, dishwasher safe. It's ironware, it's great stuff. The low fire clay, not so much. It chips real easy and it just doesn't last as long. But as I thought about the different types of clay, I thought, you know, the point is that we too are created to handle different trials, aren't we? We're created to handle different things. Just as there's diversities in ministries and diversities of gifts, according to the Holy Spirit's choosing, the Bible tells us, but it's the same God who works in and through all, meaning that some can handle much more than others. Some have handled the death of a spouse the death of a child. Some can handle cancer hitting their lives or cancer of a loved one, or you can fill in the blank. Some hard, hard things that others cannot even imagine going through. But then someone else can break their fingernail and they're crying for a week, and I can understand that. But to each person, it feels the same, doesn't it? As we go through the different trials, God knows. And the key is that God has promised in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that no temptation, we could say no trial, has overtaken you except such is as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, 
but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you shall may be under be able to bear it. Well, I love the story, speaking of the different clays of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3. Talk about high fire clay, high fire vessels. These three young Hebrew boys refused to bow and worship to the Babylonian gods and the gold image that was set up. Instead, they vowed to only serve the living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And talk about a fiery process. Again, these were three high fire vessels because the furnace was heated seven times its normal heat. But the great thing is that in the midst of the fire, they declared by faith that our God would be able to deliver us. Yet even if he didn't, they knew he was able. But even if he chose not to, they still determined they would not bow to that false golden image, the false gods. And the beautiful thing is God showed up to deliver them. In fact, he was actually with them in the midst of the fire. And it was in the midst of the fire that their, bound, their, their ropes that bound them were burned. They were released in the midst of that fire. And what was the result? The result was that God received the glory. As Nebuchadnezzar said, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own God. He made a decree that all people should worship their God and said, There is no other God who can deliver like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So God received the glory as those three men were willing to not be defiled by the world. In other words, God used it for his glory. And that's what you and I are able to do. Regardless if we understand what the outcome will be or not, we can determine that our God will deliver. And we can determine that we want to bring glory to God and not man. So as Jen finishes up this vessel, this, this final vessel and the worship comes up and we close, I just want to encourage you, wherever you find yourself tonight, maybe you're still in the pit. And you feel like, wow, I haven't been chosen. But I'm here to tell you tonight, if you choose him, then you can know that you're chosen. It's that simple. Isn't that awesome? God loves you. And he's calling you. He's calling you by name. And tonight can be that night that you can know that you're chosen. Maybe you're in the process of being wedged. You're poked and prodded and smacked around. And there's a few air bubbles in there that need to come out. Because you're thinking you're pretty special. And tonight you can realize, you know what? None of us are special. Yes, we're special and precious in the eyes of God. But we're not better than one another. We're all just a lump of clay. In different shapes, different forms, and different sizes. Maybe he's got you slammed on the wheel and you're just going round and round. Really fast and you don't even know which way is which. And you just are being centered but you're realizing that God loves you so much and his love will never change. Maybe it's just time for you to feel God's hand is upon you. Or maybe God's revealing and cleansing your heart as he is the one that is looking inside your heart. He's the only one that can see it. We can put on a really good show, can't we? But God knows what's going on in our heart. Maybe God's raising you up to be used. Oh, but be so careful not to be prideful and try to rush the process. Wait on the Lord, and he will mount you up with wings as eagles. Don't get off balanced, or he'll have to start all over again, and that is not a fun process either. But most importantly, let's not dictate to God what he wants to do in and through our lives. We need to simply be focused on being a vessel useful for the master. So with everybody's eyes closed, I just want to give that opportunity. Is there anybody in here tonight 
who has not felt like they've been chosen. They still feel like they're over in the pit and they need to be pulled out of the darkness and be brought into the marvelous light, into the master's hand. Is there anybody here tonight that would like to give their life into the master's hand? You've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and tonight is the night as the master potter is calling you. Anyone here that would like to give their life to Jesus Christ? Is there anyone here that's just struggling as they came into the city gates with burdens and you just need to lay them down and you just desire to be more pliable and allow his spirit to be poured out upon you so that he can continue to make you into the vessel that will bring honor and glory to his name. I see your hand back there. God bless you. Yes, I see your hand. See your hand. Anybody else? I see your hand. Anybody else? God is looking at your heart right now. Whether you raise your hand or not, God knows what, what state your heart is in. And he's listening no matter what state our heart's in. We can be so desperately wicked and God knows and he sees. And he's still pouring out his spirit upon you. That water that he chooses to cause you to be pliable. Anybody else that just chooses to have more of his spirit so that you can be formed into his image. Yes, I see your hand. God is so good, isn't he? He's so gentle. Let's just pray right now and we'll close with worship. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that God, it's not by might, not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. Lord, we desperately need a touch from you tonight. I'm just gonna pray on behalf of everyone, including myself. God, we pray right now that your, pour, your spirit would be poured out beyond measure. Lord, as you told the woman at the well, that anybody that thirsts could come to you and have torrents of living water poured upon her, Lord, and that we would never thirst again. But God, we move away from you so often. God, help us to abide in your presence, that your joy would fill us to overflowing. God, that we would be so pliable in your hands that it wouldn't matter what vessel you were making us into, that we would simply want to just serve you, that we would allow you to take off the rough edges, we would allow you to put us on the shelf for however long you wanted, or you would allow us to be put back into the pit for softening and reusing all over again. God, it's all about your plans for our lives. Help us to die to ourselves so that we can be emptied and that you can open up our hearts and fill us with you. God, we thank you so much that you are the faithful God even when we are faithless. God, we come to you tonight as the master potter and we pray, Lord, make us into what you will. We are willing, waiting, and still. We love you. We praise you, God. And we thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, we thank you for the work that you did at the cross. We thank you for the work that you're doing today. And we thank you for the work that you're going to do tomorrow. As we simply look to you, the author and finisher of our faith. And God, we just give it all to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's all stand and worship together.